Okay, we need to get started. Thanks, everybody. I see Bill is on there now. Hi, Bill. Hello. Oh, you got a lovely view behind you, Bill. Yes. <laughs> I, I love showing off my beautiful Oregon mountains and stuff. And so I got well, I don't blame you. I don't blame you. Anyway, uh, we can get started. Go ahead, hit Bill, and then, well, you know how it works. <laughs> we got it. Well, you know, and as I recall, when I was talking with you, Paul, you kind of wanted an update from the last session and probably a preview of the one coming up and the special session. Is that correct? Yeah, but I, I was hoping that you would talk some about the potential for, uh, you know, uh, solar energy. Uh, you know, I mean, uh, yeah, uh, and, and wind in and, and, and New Mexico and, and what's going on. And there's a lot of things going on, as I know. There's a lot going on, and so please kind of direct me back uh, if I'm not talking about the, the things or the issues that you're interested in. You know, as we've all kind of been watching the last couple of weeks with the uh, big climate um, right. <clears throat> conference over in, in uh, where are they, Scotland or uh, in Scotland. Scotland? Yeah, Glasgow. Yeah, yeah. that uh, there's lots of concern that people are, you know, making commitments, but making sure that there are huge loopholes in them to protect industry, that the economy is more important than the environment. Uh, and that's kind of what we've been seeing all along. And there's some of that going on in New Mexico right now. Yeah, the, there sure is. <laughs> certainly the, and, and all of it, you know, it's good intentioned people on both sides with things, but money is the real driver behind everything. Uh, and that's just quite frankly, you know, the reality of it. Uh, some of the things right now is trying to get the new methane rules uh, in place. New Mexico is leading the country in having solid methane requirements, but the industry is fighting it tooth and nail. Uh, they want to grandfather in anybody who's been uh, leaking methane and doing that in the past, that they don't have to clean that up. It's only going forward that the new rules require. And I think our environment department's been doing a pretty good job of holding the line on that, but there's a lot of money behind uh, the industry, which right now with oil, I think the latest I saw is it's about $85 a barrel. Yeah, between 80 and 85, yeah. Somewhere around there, which is on the order of $30 a barrel above what the state budgeted based on. And so the state is rolling in money right now. And so again, the oil and gas industry right now is again talking about how wonderful they are for the state of New Mexico. They kind of conveniently forget that a year ago when oil went below zero that and how that tanked the whole economy of New Mexico for a couple of weeks or whatever, but they're back to puffing out their chests about how wonderful they are with everything. And so, you know, we're kind of riding that roller coaster. Uh, and just kind of industry-wide is, you know, and I've been in the legislature now, this will be my 10th session coming up, so I've been in for nine years. Um, and I don't know how many of you are familiar with um, Kubler-Ross's uh, Stages of Death and Dying, you know, where it goes through, uh, the first thing is denial, that it's not oh, yeah. and anger, bargaining, uh, depression, and then acceptance. Well, I see that same thing happening with the fossil fuel industry for the, last, <laughs> for the last 30 years, because we knew this was all coming, right? And yeah. for the last 30 years, they were like, oh, no, it's not really true. It's a hoax. It's a myth. You know, it's not happening. And then they went, that was the denial stage. Then they went into the anger stage. Don't you know how much money that we provide for the state? You know, how dare you attack our industry? You know, kind of the anger uh, now they're in the bargaining stage. You know, if we clean up the, the methane stuff, you know, will you kind of let us keep going? If we clean up this, they're, they're trying to make deals with everything. Uh, but we know it's a dying industry. And so I'm waiting for the, the next stage after bargaining is the, the depression stage where they're like, oh, I guess this is really it. You know, maybe we need to figure <laughs> out something different before we get to acceptance. Um, so, you know, I, being a psychologist, that's kind of how I see as it's gone forward. The 30 years ago, when people first started talking about the climate change and that we need to do something about it, the industry for at least two decades essentially did nothing. 
you know, they drug their feet on absolutely everything all the way along. And about five years ago, they started getting into, well, maybe we need to change a little bit, but don't go too fast. It's going to cost too much. So they changed just a little bit. And now we're five years out from what they said 30 years ago was, you know, the tipping point where we can't go back. And now they're like, oh, we can't get it done in five years. And I'm sort of like, you know, if you had started 30 years ago, we could have been at the points we needed to be, but they chose not to the whole way. Uh, there's an awful lot of people, and again, who make a lot of money. Uh, yes. The industry regularly talks about how many jobs they are creating in New Mexico, all of the jobs that will be lost. What they don't tell you is most of the jobs that are being lost now are due to automation, not because of any of the requirements in industry. The whole drilling process and everything is being automated, and so when people didn't or lost jobs when the industry tanked a year ago for a short while, they just aren't being rehired because it's now more technologically feasible to do it with less people. And so it's a bit of a, of a bait and switch to say that all the jobs that are going to be lost due to the industry. Um, also, most of those jobs, um, and I'll kind of, if you're interested, you know, as we have an hour here or whatever, and start talking about redistricting, is the area of New Mexico with the highest growth in population was over in the Hobbs area. But most of that is an artificial growth. Most of that were the workers that came in in the man camps when the industry was doing well, when the census date count came. Uh, and so they aren't real people over there. And so lots of those jobs that supposedly were losing were people from North Dakota and Texas and other places that came in just for the jobs that have now left. And so they really weren't New Mexicans who are losing the jobs. Uh, in New Mexico, one of the other really big things that's going on right now is what to do with the produced water. Uh, I don't, was it in the newspaper or somewhere? I was just yeah, recently. Just recently, reading, it was in there, yeah. Where it talked about for every barrel of oil, they produce something like 10 barrels of produced water, which is incredibly saline and has all kinds of other fracked materials and stuff in it. Extremely toxic. It's very toxic. And so the discussion then is, can that water be cleaned up for reuse in the oil field? And to what level can it be cleaned up for other kinds of uses? Uh, some of the things, and some people are very angry and don't want to do anything with it. And that's based a bit more, they want all the fracking to stop. That's a different discussion. But you can take that water and take it back to absolutely clean, pure water. You know, there's nothing but H2O. That's very expensive. And so the discussion really is how much does it need to be cleaned up to be safe for the different kinds of uses? Uh, if you're going to use it just to keep dust down by spraying it on the roads, it doesn't have to be cleaned up to the same level as if you're going to put it on crops. And crops probably doesn't have to be cleaned as much as if you're going to use it for animal watering, which doesn't have to be as much as if you're going to use it for municipal water supplies. Each of those is almost, uh, I'm, I'll make up some numbers, but is an order of magnitude more expensive to get to that level of cleanliness. And so that's the real discussion is how much is it going to cost to get that much of additional cleanliness in the water. And so that's one of the ongoing ones. There is research being done by New Mexico State and others that are looking at which kind of crops and how much do they take up the, the nasties that are in the water and put it into the crop? How much does that actually clean it up? I mean, that's a whole area of, of things. So when people just say you can't do anything with it, yeah, it's not economical to do that, but we can clean it up to where it's completely pure water. It's just very expensive to do so. So, you know, that's one of the pieces. Now, specifically about wind and solar, and you're going to get some of my biases and takes on some of this. In New Mexico, there are huge, if you haven't driven up the, is it Highway 54 that goes through Almogordo and then heads yeah. north and drive yeah. up through there, there are hundreds and hundreds, literally, I'm not making it up, hundreds and hundreds of wind turbines going in up by Vaughn and up towards Santa Rosa. Uh, you go through a forest of these, of which some of them are up and running, and you can see the pads where new ones are going in, and some that just have the towers up. Um, I think most of that is the, I'm trying to remember the company, um, 
I think they call that the Sagamore uh, wind farm. And lots of people are like, wow, New Mexico is getting all of this clean, green energy. No, not happening. All, catch this, all of that electricity that's being generated and coming off those towers is being sent to California and sold in California. All of it. It's not going a in. line going across to get that in? I'm sorry, what? Did they have a line? I mean, a, a power line? Or? They've got some transmission now. They're trying to get additional transmission going across White Sands and some of the other yeah, places. I, I, I heard but those that. transmission lines are going across New Mexico. They are not trunked into New Mexico. It's <laughs> not going into PNM to to fuel the electricity needs of Albuquerque. It's not going to El Paso Electric. All of that electricity. I talked to the people that were building it a couple of years ago. They would love to sell it in New Mexico, but PNM won't buy it because one of the things about electricity generation, you know, and please, you know, pull me back or ask questions if I'm getting too much into the weeds. Our investor owned utilities and in New Mexico, it's mostly El Paso Electric and PNM. They provide about 60% of all the electricity in New Mexico. The others pr are provided by the rural electric co-ops. Mm -hmm. Those two companies are investor owned utilities. Investor-owned utilities are set up as guaranteed monopolies. They have a guarantee service area where they are the only providers allowed in that area. There is no competition. And they are guaranteed, I think it's about a 9% return on investment. Yeah, 9 guaranteed. or 10%. I thought it was 10. It, it's, it's 9 point something, I think, but it's somewhere yeah. right around there. Guarantee return on investment. The investment are undepreciated assets. They make no money whatsoever on fuel costs, on electricity, on anything else. Those are all pass-through costs. Whatever it costs them, they pass it on to you. Um, and that's built into all the rate cases and everything else. All of the profit, all the profit comes from 9% interest on undepreciated assets, which gives them a well, if they can borrow it at one and a half, two percent, and that, that that's a, that's automatic money. It's an incentive to own assets, and yeah. so they are always wanting to put in a new gas fire turbine. They are always wanting to put in more transmission lines. More, you know, they want to yeah. upgrade all of their uh, transfer stations. All of those things are their undepreciated assets. Those wind turbines don't belong to PNM or El Paso Electric. They don't own that asset that's now generating the electricity compared to them owning the gas turbines at their plants. And therefore, they have no interest in providing cheap electricity that they can buy coming off of those towers because they make no profit off yeah. of it. Yeah. You know, and it took me a while to, I kind of was like, what? You know, to really understand that. Most of us, and I think the electric rates here in Las Cruces, we pay somewhere around 12 or 13 cents a kilowatt hour. Is that right? Anybody yeah, something like remember? that. The wind comes off of those turbines at under two cents a kilowatt hour. Wow. And, and that is with the profit built in by the company that made them. That is their total cost over the lifetime is it comes off those at two cents a kilowatt hour. It gets sold in California at nine to 10 cents a kilowatt hour. Hmm. seven cents or so of the kilowatt hour is the transmission cost to get it out to California. It's the losses in transmission and the fees they have to pay to the companies, El Paso Electric and PNM, that own the transmission lines to get it out there. And so the big transmission line that people talk about going across White Sands is a private company that wants to build the transmission and then charge Sagamore Wind Farm to transport electrons to California. They're not going to New Mexico. We don't, and, and when the electrons get sold in California, the GRT is in California where it's sold, not here in New Mexico. Wow. Okay. Yeah. But hopefully you're, I'm getting a little bit of, oh my gosh, type of a thing. Yeah. Is we are being exploited. Um, yeah. If you like the beautiful views of New Mexico and you think wind turbines disturb all of that, those wind turbines are providing power for California in our landscape.
Uh, <laughs> we do get jobs while the turbines are being built. And the landowner, lots of those farmers and ranchers out there, do get a monthly check for the pad yeah. space. So yeah. they're getting some money of which they are, and I'm not accusing or anything like that, they are supposed to be putting on their income taxes as generating money from their ranch lands. <laughs> okay, which New Mexico gets a little bit of that. But we currently don't tax any of those electrons coming off those towers, and they're all going to California. But we've got all the generation here, and the blight on our landscape is here in oh. New Mexico. Wow. Some of that are laws that we currently have in place um, that protect the investor-owned utilities from any competition on the monopolies. And those utilities, uh, wind turbines and solar panels, once they're up, have very, very low maintenance costs compared to a gas turbine or a coal turbines or any of the other things, which means once they're up, the, the asset starts to be depreciated and there's no more profit to be made by the investor-owned utilities. Anytime El Paso Electric or PM talks about they want to be good stewards of the environment, that they want to you know, do good things and provide cheap electricity for New Mexicans, it's, and I think one of the current terms is they're greenwashing. Uh, they're trying to make themselves sound like they're environmental, but they are a, an investor owned utility and they have a fiduciary responsibility to maximize profits for their shareholders. And that's all, not to the people. And so they are constantly in litigation with the PRC, which are supposedly our advocates in the whole process. And they're in litigation all the time with the PRC and our attorney general is supposed to be representing us directly in those hearings. The attorney general typically has a lawyer there, but those aren't really the fights they wanna be engaged and involved in. Um, as we're coming around to election season, when we're gonna be electing a new attorney general, if you get an opportunity, ask the attorney general how they're going to be an activist for the people in the rate cases with the PRC, because currently they don't do a whole lot on that. And all of the lawyers, I actually, I think it was the Retake Our Democracy group up in Santa Fe. I was talking to them, doing kind of a similar presentation with them as they were asking questions. And they were all pleased with themselves because, and some of it was a good thing. They got a couple of people to be shareholders in PNM, which meant they had votes at the national or the yearly meeting and actually brought up some of the issues and the, the main administration of PNM and the, the company wasn't happy about all that because suddenly they had to ask questions instead of just kind of nodding their heads about you know how much money they were making for shareholders is was a bit of a shareholder revolt. Um, and PNM then had to hire a bunch of lawyers to defend against the PRC and some of the things the shareholders did. And they were like, and we made PNM have to hire lawyers and pay for lawyers. And I corrected them. It's like, lawyers are part of the pass-through costs that go to the, all of the utility users. They are not a cost to PNM. And so PNM shows up with 15 or 20 lawyers. And we have one from the attorney general's office. My sister has done some uh, bonus, you know, just yeah, know I think the right work yeah. for them, you know, particularly on El Paso Electric. And, you know, all of those lawyers that are defending, you know, what the corporation is doing are all coming right out of your rate costs. You know, we pay for all of that. It is a pass-through cost. All of their profits <laughs> come from the 9% on undepreciated assets. Everything else they get to write off. Everything else. Is there Let me any stop for chance, a moment and see if there are questions. Is there any chance to change this law where they get a guaranteed return on investment? Any chance? There is. And that's some of the discussions that are going on now. Uh, one of the biggest ones is changing the law that make them the sole provider of power. And so where all of their assets in the past or their big assets have been uh, power plants, coal plants, yeah. uh, gas turbines, things of that yeah. sort. Well, there are a number of companies now that want to put in 
landscape scale solar panels and wind turbines and things of that sort. But PNM doesn't have to buy it because they don't make any profit off of it. And so it's to change that law that they must take any of the power that is put onto the system. And what it would do is essentially change it from being a power generation company to a power distribution company. Yeah. And so yeah. they would still get return on investment of the distribution lines, you know, all of that, but that they would be buying power on the open market at the cheapest rate that it could be. Now, if they can provide the power cheaper than they can buy it, that's fine. But if you can buy the power cheaper on the open market than they're producing it, they'd be required to do that. That's going to be a big lift. We've got yeah, a long time of this investor-owned utility model. And quite frankly, it was a great model when we were trying to electrify everything, when we were trying to get electricity out to you know, the rural areas where there wasn't yeah. a lot of profit to be made. They had a responsibility to provide electricity everywhere in their a guaranteed area, but with that came that they agreed to be regulated and <clears throat> that you know they would provide for all of them for this guarantee of 9% return on investment. And so it encouraged them to put in big money on investments to get all of this done, where a smaller companies couldn't make those large investments. Now, because we've got solar, rooftop solar, landscape solar, and we've got wind turbines, a more distributed model rather than just this great big behemoth company uh, doing more of a hub and a spoke type of electric system, we've got distributed generation. And the distributed generation doesn't fit in with the old model. They are big companies. They have a lot of money. Uh, they spread that money around to a lot of key legislators, both in the state level, but also federally the model to keep that monopoly status that they have, you know, and so um, there are some of us that are working on trying to nibble away and change some of that. Certainly Steve Fishman, who is up, I think he's the chair of the PRC now. Yeah, but yeah he, is. he gets lots of this, but he's one member and, you know, he's fighting a whole lot because lots of this has to go through hearing officers and lawyers and all kinds of other things. Um, yeah. I think this next year, our PRC model is going to change from five elected PRC commissioners to, I think it goes to three appointed by the governor yeah. with the approval of the Senate, if I remember how the legislation went. Yeah. That's both good and bad. Uh, some we've been slow to change the model because there were a number of more conservative um, Right members of the PRC who very much were uh, supported by the industry and lots of money behind that. And so we, I think right now the PRC's got two really strong progressives, uh, a conservative and two kind of that are in the middle that kind of like the job, but they're not terribly invested kind of either way. They'll go with whichever way the wind seems to be blowing at the moment. In, in economics, we study uh, so far as uh, captured regulatory system, uh, always utilities came up as the number one <laughs> as being captured, regulators being captured by the industry. And, and really, yes. I'm going back 20, 30 years, 40 years. <laughs> by the Anyone way, if I can take just a yeah, moment. Go ahead, David. David, go ahead. If I can take just a moment of for, for, for privilege is uh, Adelaide Oberding, who's on here, is my uh, student intern, who's a student senior over at Las Cruces High School. So I invited her to come on this also. And so you were wondering who that other person is. So hi, Adelaide, glad you're here. Hi, thank you for having me. Uh, go ahead, David. Okay, As Senator Souls, you, you were mentioned at the beginning of your uh, very interesting and uh, information packed presentation. Uh, off the cuff, very impressive. Uh, you mentioned the, uh, the issue of uh, the amount of water that is uh, consumed in, in order to frack. And I read this in this morning's paper that the state's water czar has, uh, has resigned from our- yeah, Mr. D'Antonio. Uh, because of uh, the lack of resources for his office. What, what, what can you tell us about that? And, and well, we are still recovering from the eight years of the Martinez administration. 
where she very actively made sure that all of the agencies that controlled the environment, so the water office, the environment department, the oil conservation division, uh, didn't uh, rehire people when they left, you know, and so there was a huge gap there. Um, I think we've been working on trying to refill those until the last year or two, there hasn't been any money in the budget to hire a bunch of other people into those. Uh, there is money now, and so I'm hoping that that will, will change. Water, uh, whether it's dealing with the fracking, particularly in the Northwest and the Southeast, is a big deal. Um, farmers down around the Carlsbad area are really, really concerned because the Pecos River doesn't have nearly the flow that it used to have. And partly it's because some people have sold all of their water rights off to oil and gas. I have, I've got a map up in my office in Santa Fe that is a conglomeration of satellite images of New Mexico. But you can very clearly on the east side of the state see the Ilkalala aquifer where it comes into the east side of New Mexico and you can see where it's pulled back because it's nice and green over right on the very east side of it but then there's about 25 miles where it's now brown but you can see the outline of where it was because that aquifer has been drawn down by Texas, New Mexico and various others pumping the water uh, for other uses and so you know it absolutely we've got some water crises over there and the farmers are the ones that are losing out as the big money of oil and gas is buying up lots of the water rights. Uh, my understanding is they can use brackish water um, or the produced water can be reprocessed to a level they can use it, but it's money. Um, it's a lot cheaper to just get new fresh water. And most of the time when they're done with it, instead of cleaning it up, it gets deep injected into old wells, which means it's completely pulled out of the whole water system we all learned about in elementary schools about how you know, the lakes evaporate into rain clouds that come back down. This water gets deep injected. It is consumed completely. It is not just used like water on agriculture is essentially just borrowed and used, but stays in the whole water cycle. Um, also, you probably have heard there's, um, it's still correlation but it's getting stronger and stronger that lots of the earthquakes in Oklahoma, parts of Texas and some in New Mexico are a direct result of deep injecting right. that water into unstable formations that it is uh, looking more and more causal as a result. And Oklahoma for uh, watershed has been in trouble for many years. Uh, it's been, I'm going back 30, 40 years. I mean, it, it's been projected to have issues. Well, and Paul, lots of in the past, the the projections were based on pumping it and putting it into the right. crop circle types right. of things. Now it's being taken out, and it's not going into the water cycle. It's being oh. consumed and deep injected, full of salts. Yeah, yeah. Anyone else have a comment or question? Go ahead. Yeah, I, I, with regard to this issue about the. Uh, uh, deep injection and the use of water rights. Is, is there a state oversight on the industrial extraction of water or is it uh, just that uh, uh, a point of use uh, without controls? There is control, but that's part of the problems we've got in New Mexico is all of the water in New Mexico is accounted for. Uh, it's spoken for. In fact, up to 150% it's spoken for is the number that I typically hear. Uh, when they set it up, and I'll get some of the dates wrong, but it was like back in the 30s, yeah. which was a particularly wet period of time, is they allocated the surface and the ground water uh, to various entities, and everybody has claims on that. Uh, the talk in New Mexico, if you want to be a lawyer and get rich forever, is be a water lawyer. Uh, the <laughs> politics of it and the law on it is so complex and complicated because it's international law also. We've got treaties with Mexico on how much water we have to send to them. Uh, and in fact, it, you know, some of the, right now, New Mexico is in the Supreme Court with Texas over the amount of water we send down the Rio Grande. And people think, well, that's the Doniana County. No, we are actually on the Texas side of that lawsuit. 
because it's the middle Rio Grande, which comes down to Elephant Butte. Lower Elephant Butte is more into the Texas side of how much water is supposed to be delivered. And so, you know, there are all these very complex concerns that the water, um, yeah, I can't get the right word, but Mr. D'Antonio who just resigned overseas, as well as all the Interstate Stream Commission. And it even gets into uh, the Fish and Game Department dealing yeah. with fishing access on streams and what's considered a navigable river falls under one thing and small streams fall under another as to whether they can have fences put across them. Uh, and we've had some very serious conversations about the lack of water in New Mexico. We all know that we're in a drought coupled with climate change that's increasing the temperature and the two of them together are decreasing the amount of water that we've got. We had real serious concerns until about two years ago. Remember we had that really wet summer? Yeah. And it was like, oh good, it's over. Well, it's not <laughs> over. Um, one of the water people at a committee we had up in Santa Fe came in and it, it quite frankly scared a lot of people because in New Mexico, about at least a third, if not half of all the legislators live in the Albuquerque area where the Sandia Mountains are their east backdrop, like we have our organs. And the guy came in and said very frankly that if we don't fix what's going on in 20 to 30 years, the Sandia Mountains will look like the Franklin Mountains above El Paso. Wow. <laughs> and then he just sat there for about 30 seconds and let that sink in. You know, because the Sandia Mountains are have trees on them and are pretty green and they get snow in the winter and and a lot of people have been down to El Paso and have seen that those are completely desert mountains down in El Paso area. There are no trees. I mean, our organs, we've got a little bit of, of more green and trees. But, you know, that's what we're looking at if we don't start fixing all of it. And we've got problems here in the Doniana County area. Um, if When I was a kid, the Stamen came in and started planting pecan trees. He was the first one, you know, and Stalman Farms are still huge pecan producers, but now Solipex and every farm and ranch up and down the valley has pecan trees on them. Yep. Pecan trees were started here. They are typically swamp trees. So they're out of Georgia and Mississippi and things like that is more their natural growth area. By growing them here, the dry climate makes sure that bugs like the hickory shuckworm can't grow. And so our pecans don't deal with near the pest problems that they have in Georgia and other places where the pests grew up with the trees. But we grow our trees here with irrigation, where there it's more natural water types of things. And so I regularly tell people, it's like, you know, we're growing swamp trees in the <laughs> desert with snow from Colorado. That's not very sustainable. No, it's not. And once and once you planted the trees and you get a couple of dry years, you can't just say, oh, you don't get any water this year. And so, because the trees die. Um, you know, if it's a dry year, you could even pay farmers not to grow cotton, not to grow lettuce, not to grow chili. You know, the land's still going to be there. And when there's water again, you could do that. But when you have trees on the land, you know, suddenly their huge asset of 10 years of growing those trees dies. And so they have a very powerful uh, voice about ensuring water. A uh, couple of stories about it. Again, the water down here in Doniana County is more than 150% allocated. Uh, a typical, what is considered a normal water year is about three to four acre feet of water. So that each acre of farmland would get enough water allocations that would cover it two, you know, a couple of feet deep over the course of a year. The last several years, we've gotten six inches, four inches, almost no water at all, but we put in more and more pecan trees. So how do you keep the pecan trees alive? You've got to pump water out of the aquifer. And so they pump the water and the river down here is just the visible part of the underground aquifer that flows south. And so the water table here, those of you remember when there was water in Burn Lake? Burn Lake was where the water table was in the past. 
There hasn't been water in Burn Lake in 15 to 20 years now, probably. And I've got a kind of a small property with a rental trailer on it up in Doniana, and it had a well on it. My well is dry because the water table has dropped 30 feet. And that's because all of the farmers, when there's not enough irrigation water coming down, are pumping water, lowering the water table in order to keep their trees alive. I kind of diverted off of things. I apologize. I mean, we were talking about wind and stuff, but it's all sort of related. I, I'm, I have a friend of mine that, uh, that I golf with, and he sold about 40 acres of land, about $19,000 an acre. But, that, that you know, they have to pump it, of course. <laughs> Yeah, the, the water rights on the land is probably worth as much as the land itself is. Oh, yeah. yeah. Uh, and we passed a law a couple of years ago that if people are subdividing the land, you can't subdivide the water rights out. Huh. In that you can't sell the water rights and then sell the land and then the person demand that they get water put back onto the, the property. You know, they, they are then allowed to pump water somewhere else. Uh, that. You can't do that because that just doubles the problem. Yeah. Anyone else have a comment or question? Anyone else? Well, a comment. I would, we, we sort of started down the road of uh, Bill talking about the importance of the oil and gas revenue to the state and how flush we are today. Is anybody looking down the road like if that money goes away, where, where does our money come from as a state? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for asking that, David, because that's an area I'm very much engaged and involved in. Um, as I indicated, when oil and gas always talks about how great they are for the state, how much they do for education, that you know, education is 45% of the budget and oil and gas provides something like you know, 60% of all the money going to education, which is all true. When they tanked the economy, when oil went below zero, they didn't suddenly come and go, oh, we're so sorry, you know, please forgive us for, for tanking the entire economy. Um, the concerns are when there is lots of money and similar to with water, when the rain starts falling, people forget about we're in a water crisis. Uh, when there's lots of money coming from oil and gas, people are happy about it. I mean, our budgets this next year are so flush with money, we don't know what to do with all of it. And so I've been making a big push that those extra monies we need to use to make investments into a different future off of oil and gas. Uh, some of the particular places we can do that is make investments in research at universities, is move towards an innovation economy. Uh, it's the same thing that the research triangle people did down in North Carolina, North Carolina State and Duke, where they move that economy off of a tobacco-based economy into a high-tech information economy. And New Mexico should use the windfall of extra monies we have now to support more research and innovation. Uh, we also, and I'm pleased the governor is doing some of it. I think we could do a lot more. But here, particularly in Doniana County, we sit at the crossroads of a continent. Uh, north and south, we've got one of the busiest port of entries coming up from Mexico into the United States. And we also are an inland port for goods coming from Asia. Uh, and I don't know how many of you are aware, let me tell you a brief little story is, and you may have heard a couple of weeks ago, I haven't heard as much about it recently, but the port of Long Beach had 20 ships out waiting to be allowed to unload. They were out there for weeks, be waiting their turn to unload. Mm -hmm. uh, Santa Teresa is the unload point for those ships. When they come in, they, the cranes take them off and put them on trains as fast as they can go. And as soon as the train is full, they don't even open the containers. As soon as the train's full, the train overnights to Santa Teresa, where they've got time and space to separate out all the containers. Some of them continue east, some head north, and some of the containers go back to California. That all happens down in Santa Teresa is where they get sorted, not in Long Beach. Long Beach is landlocked. If they tried to sort them there, there, the backup would be even worse. Uh, and so right now, if you look at our interstates, they have so many trucks on them right now as we're trying to catch up on the backlog of all of the goods and services that are coming in. And a lot of that is happening down at Santa Teresa. 
They're also, and I've heard from Jerry Pacheco, who is with the Border Authority. Yeah, I don't know yeah. if it's the Border Authority, but the group down there that, and uh, one of the figures he quoted is there's one and a half billion dollars worth of commerce comes across the Santa Teresa yeah. Port of Entry every month. Every month. Yeah, it's... And, I made that comment one time I was at a conference up in Idaho and the lady looked at me and went, wow, that's a lot of drugs. <laughs> it's not drugs, it's TVs, it's car parts. You know, it's flat screen TVs and refrigerators. You know, it's <laughs> commerce that's coming across there, but it's a bottleneck there. Uh, it's a bottleneck on getting all of that stuff onto the interstates. If you've ever been there, you have to go on a two lane road through a numerous stoplights to get it into essentially El Paso and then all the problems of going through El Paso and other places. Um, so I'm trying to promote that we build a West Mesa road for trucks to get bring it in up to the loves up by the airport so that New Mexico gets that GRT instead of leading all of that into El Paso and then put warehousing along that area so it can act as the the transfer of the goods and services onto the trucks going the right places all along. And, you know, and hopefully we can do some of that, but that's a huge economic boom for our area if we take advantage of that. And that's just the logistics of moving goods and services north, south, east, west. And lots of it because of the accident of geography, we are at the crossroads of a continent. Yeah, David? Or Dave? Yeah, uh, yeah Bill. Uh, what you're saying just makes so much sense in terms of, uh, you know, of, of using flush times to invest uh, for the future. I can't imagine anybody arguing against that, but I'm sure that there are people arguing against it. And what are their arguments? Um, used to be uh, Senator Smith out of Deming uh, was very much, you know, my opinion, kind of a Frady cat. You know, that it's like, oh, these good times they aren't going to last. We've got to you know, put more money away for the next bad time type of thing instead of making investments into a different future. There are still some of the more conservative groups that think that what we ought to be doing with all this extra money is buying more mattresses to stuff it in. You know, is just putting more of it into Wall Street. You know, that this is scary. It's not going to last. You know, we need to make investments for our grandchildren. And I try and point out you know, we've got children now who we need to make the investments in. We need to make investments in a different future, not continue to ride the roller coaster of the up and down of the oil and gas industry. Uh, you know, and I think there's a real move to do that. Uh, some of the problem is last year we were pretty flush with money as well as we went through the legislative session. And our cash reserves right now are at, last I heard, is 38%. Any of you have ever dealt with universities, nonprofits, school boards, or anything of that sort, it used to be 10% was considered about the amount you needed to have in cash reserves. Mm -hmm. uh, and in fact, and I've looked it up and the finance people hate it. I'm not a finance person, but I can read. And so I looked up uh, Moody's who does the credit ratings of the different states and what they recommend the cash reserves for New Mexico to be to maintain security of our credit rating. And they recommend that for um, an unusual downturn that we have credit or we maintain cash reserves of about 12 to 14%. And for a highly, um, I got the word wrong, but like highly unusual, which it means less than a 5% chance. So 0 0.05 probability, they recommend cash reserves of between 16 to 20%. We currently have cash reserves of 38%. And the economists in New Mexico say, oh yeah, but Moody's doesn't know how much we're reliant on oil and gas and it goes up and down. And I'm kind of like, you know, Moody's has like the top economists in the country. Any of the economists working for New Mexico, if they could, would take the job at Moody's in a heartbeat. You know, that Moody's does pay attention to what New Mexico's economy is based on and what's going on in the price of oil and gas. They absolutely know all of that. But it's this mentality of, it's really scary and we don't want to, you know, we want to be overly cautious. So we're going to protect against a 0 0.0001 probability of an economic downturn. And as a result, we're not making the investments in the future that helps prevent that economic downturn by having a different, an economy based on a different uh, vision. And in the meantime, we, 
and in the meantime, we uh, we export to other states uh, our our brightest, best educated, most innovative minds, rather than making the investments that would keep them here. Yes, it was about a week and a half ago or so. I was one of the keynote speakers at NMSU for their. Uh, you know, or uh, research and creativity conference. Mm -hmm. um, and the title of my talk was Innovate or the Anatomy of Innovation, how research, creativity, and technology can lead us to a different future. And kind of talking about very much these, these absolute things that we need to make investments now to move to a different direction so that as oil and gas, and kind of back to the beginning, oil and gas is a dying industry. I mean, a, it shows in just how they're approaching it, that it is a failing industry over time, that we need to make those investments now in a different future. Uh, we, uh, you mentioned before the importance of uh, like the triangle in North Carolina. By the way, my son works there and he works in high tech. He's a, 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 pro, a programmer for uh, uh, Fidelity. But they have, you know, taken the knowledge from those universities and brought it into high tech and they have a booming economy. Is there any chance that we could do that here? I mean, we're doing it a little in Arrowhead and so forth, but I just think we're just kind of dribbling. You know, that's it. You're exactly right. And that's an area, Paul, I'm directly involved in with some legislation that it looks like it's actually getting some traction this year. I've introduced it for the last three years and could never get it out of the finance committee. Um, and partly the finance committee, again, Senator Smith was very much pro oil and gas, and we've got to support that industry. Uh, last year's session, the budget was still built by Smith and that group instead of Senator Munoz, who's now the chair yeah. of finance. And so this is our first year where we really get to kind of move in a different direction. Um, the bill, and it's uh, supported by CUP, the Council of University Presidents, um, that are led by New Mexico State, UNM, and tech in Socorro yeah. the, to have what, what we're calling a research closing fund. Every one of their vice presidents for research can tell stories about faculty who came wanting to put in big money grants, multi-million dollar grants for research. And at universities, almost all grants require matching funds yeah, from the do. university. Some of that can be made up through um, in-kind types of things of space and electricity and things of that sort. But some of it has to be actual cash and the budgets for universities have been cut particularly in research areas um, yeah. over the last 20 years. Every time there's an economic downturn, universities and public ed are first on the chopping block because that's where a lot of the money goes and, it, and they haven't been replaced. And so this particular bill uh, would put $40 million into an account that when somebody goes out for a major research grant, the matching funds would go into escrow. If they get the grant, then this provides the matching funds so that New Mexico gets that grant and doesn't have to tell faculty not to go out for particular research. Um, I got a lot of traction. People on the finance committee are now talking about it and we've got enough money to fund it. Um, it also, and I tell people, it's a semi-recurring, which means, you know, if we're able to use it and this is working, we ought to keep putting money in it. But if the budget goes really south, this is a place next year you don't have to put $40 million in. You can pull that back out. You know, that we understand that. But we know that every dollar we invest in research brings in $4 of additional grant money and research, mm -hmm. as well as supporting faculty, graduate students, undergraduate students, and spins off entrepreneurs and patents and other things that all build that innovation um, culture. I, I was uh, in Washington. I was uh, part of the corporate, uh, you know, the land grant institutions. And so I was deputy administrator. And so I really understand that. And that is exactly right. you got to have matching funds and then the facilities and all that sort of thing. And well, a million dollar grant require a million dollar grant may require hundreds of thousands of dollars of matching funds, and the universities don't have it. No, they don't. They just don't. David, I see oh. you're trying to get in. Uh, this they, this is the other David. Um, the I had heard from the New Mexico uh, Health Group that's working on uh, trying to improve that there there is some uh, sort of an overhang regarding malpractice in the medical field that is uh, raising questions about the 
you know, by interest by professional doctors to come to New Mexico. Can you comment on that? That that's, seems to be requiring some funding. I am, I don't know a lot about that. Uh, the, some of the concerns that I, I'm aware of is there's been some, um, the law that was passed on malpractice is per institution. And so the large hospitals and in Las Cruces Memorial and Mountain View pay the same amount for malpractice that an individual would pay in, in private practice. And the payouts by them are the same. And so what that does is it has the individual doctors paying a higher total uh, portion and the out of town for profit hospitals are paying way below what their share ought to be. Um, now that's an extreme simplification because this is not my area. Um, we hear regularly that that's why doctors aren't coming to New Mexico, but you, if you actually talk to the doctors, that's not why. Uh, it has much more to do with, they want quality of life. And so there are plenty of doctors in Albuquerque. There are plenty of doctors in Santa Fe. Las Cruces is a little below what we ought to have. But when you get to Silver City, you get to Hobbs, you get to Carlsbad and some of these other places, doctors want more, they want to be able to travel. And if you live in Carlsbad, it's a two hour drive to El Paso to catch a flight. Um, those yeah. are the kind of things that are probably keeping the doctors out more than talking about what their uh, malpractice insurance is and things of that sort. And also, you know, the shortage of nurses that we have. And so yeah. it just makes the whole system a whole lot harder. Um, it's really been a big help, particularly for Southern New Mexico, having Burrell College come in, in that lots of those uh those students are going through and doing internships around New Mexico. And we know that what, if they do internships in New Mexico, they're more likely to stay. Uh, New Mexico has been working very hard on increasing the number of slots for internships, particularly out in the, the hinterlands, so to speak, more. And that's a much better way of getting more of the docs out into those areas than trying to recruit someone out of Chicago to come you know, work out in the Indian reservation area of Gallup. You know, that just isn't going to work. You know, Thank you, so you get people that you know through their um, their residency are setting down roots in a community, and they're more likely to stay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate I have, it. I have two medical doctors in my family, and uh, he, you're absolutely right. <laughs> so far as why they locate, uh, uh, Jim. Uh, we had Jim Peach on uh, roundtable about two three weeks ago, and he said, "I love listening to Doctor Peach. He's wonderful." Oh, he is great. And anyway, he put out a statistic that really blew my mind, that 40% of the students in Dona Ana County live be below the poverty line. How in the hell can they possibly come up to a level where they can compete in a modern economy? That is tough. I mean, yeah, they don't have any mentors, they don't have any relationships. And, you know, that is really, really tough. Yeah. So many of the problems that we hear about in our public schools and in our community are not public school problems, they're community problems. They are problems where we are not dealing with the poverty issues, with the homeless issues in uh, Doniana County. It might be Doniana County, it might be Las Cruces, but we are short something like a thousand housing units for people yeah. Yeah. Of, of affordable housing. And we just don't have them. And the builders right now are building as fast as they can, but most of the building is going up on more of the high-end ones where they make more yes, money and is. profit. Now that has some trickle down as people move up to those, it opens up others in the more the affordable area. But we have a huge housing problem here. Uh, we have a huge mental health problem. All of those contribute to making it tough for, for kids to get what they need. And, and Paul, I would recommend sometime, you know, if you're looking for a speaker for this, is to get Cassandra Gandata, my partner, but who's uh, the mayor pro tem, but she's got a group called Resilience Leaders, which What's is working name? for- What's his name again? Her name, Cassandra Gandata. Cassandra Gandata. Gandata, G-A-N-D-A-R-A. -A -A. But I can make the connection if, if you need. But 
she can tell you all about, and, and it really gets down to ACEs, adverse childhood experiences. Mm -hmm. And are we setting up our community to be a place where it's healthy for kids to grow up and live? Or are we ignoring children and just going around the poor areas of Las Cruces and glad it's not us? Yeah, it, it's, a, I think, 40% and below poverty. You know, I grew up in Minnesota, and I don't, we, we probably had 2% or so. I mean, I don't, you know, contrast is just unbelievable. Yeah, and, you know, regularly when, you know, we've had elections and other things, people running against me, you know, they say, you know, we're, 50th in, in education, your chair of education, you know, I can do a better job. Why aren't you doing anything about it? And I'm like, education is the back end of where the problem is. When we've got children growing up in poverty who are coming to us in grade school, the poverty, the lack of opportunities, the other kinds of things that they've already experienced that we allow to happen in our society, they start school a year behind at five years old. They are already 20 at least percent behind. One or two years. And okay. and we know that while they're in school, they track perfectly with the affluent kids. Summer comes and the affluent kids continue to learn and do well because their parents put them into camp and takes them to museums and travel and other kinds of things. And the kids with less opportunity, they don't regress, they stay flat, but you then start the next year and the affluent kids are another month ahead. Yeah. You know, and that's where we've got the problems in education is we aren't dealing with the society problems of poverty and opportunity. And I, you know, when we were starting, uh, Alicia was talking about the, the, the lack of, um, of culture within all of society. And that's all yeah. part of that. They're all associated those same things where we're not providing all children the same opportunities from the very, very start. And schools then are just reflecting that as we continue on. Yep, they are. Anyone else have a comment or question? We're getting close to the end there. Yeah, so anyone, anyone? Okay, well, thank you, Bill. Thank you. My pleasure, I hope that was informative. Okay.